I'm Dion Mack, Senior Manager of Global Diversity and Inclusion within the Space Systems Company Division of Lockheed Martin. And I am really thrilled to be a part of tonight's We Achieve Award Ceremony and to announce tonight's closing keynote ceremony speaker, Maya Dorado, Olympic gold medalist, and if that wasn't enough, she's also an engineer. Is that not awesome? If you watch the Rio Olympics, you will know our special guest today. Maya Dorado is an Olympic swimmer who won four medals representing Team USA in extraordinary performances in Brazil. Maya is from California and attended and swam for Stanford University. She graduated in 2014, go Stanford, with a degree in management science and engineering. In addition to winning NCAA titles in both the 200 meter and 400 meter yard medley. Maya collected world championship titles throughout her career and tried out for the 2012 Olympic Games but unfortunately did not qualify. She dedicated herself to training and making a team in 2016 and qualified for three events in her first Olympic Games. She had a bonus event due to her performance and was put on the 4x200 meter freestyle medley and helped the team bring in the goal. In her individual performances, she won a silver medal in the 400 meter medley and a bronze in the 200 individual medley. On the last day of swimming competition, she pulled off one of the most exciting wins against her formidable rival, winning the gold in the 200 meter backstroke. Maya had been trailing the race, and in the last 20 meters, won by .06 seconds. Isn't that awesome? <laughs> like, that's like, like a nanosecond, .06 seconds. I'm not a good swimmer, but I have to say the backstroke is like the one stroke that I can do well, but not like that. <laughs> as you can see from Maya's reaction to the win, is a recognized favorite moment of the games as she shared her pure joy, gratitude, and excitement with the world. Though Maya is now retired, she is embarking on her next career as a business analyst at McKinsey & Company in Atlanta, Georgia, but we are trying to get her at Lockheed. <laughs> And without further ado, please welcome Olympic and world champion, Maya Dorado. Hi, thank you all so much for having me. Um, it's nice to be home, literally in my backyard. Uh, can you be in Northern California? Um, but I would like you to please forget the bio you just heard. I'm going to stress how normal I am, hopefully. <laughs> Um, in this speech tonight. Yeah, as, as was mentioned, I grew up in Santa Rosa, not too far from here. Um, nice, love it. Um, and I swam my entire age group career for the city's local swim team. Started when I was six years old, um, up until when I was 18, when I left to go to swim at Stanford, my dream school. Um, my story is very straightforward. It lacks sort of the pivotal moment, the devastating defeat. Um, there's no like rock bottom followed by a miraculous comeback. Uh, but what it lacks in drama, I think it makes up for in relatability. And so instead of inspiring you through stories of um, you know, wrenching hardships, uh, overcome by uh, once-in-a-generation talent, I hope to inspire you through my normalcy. I know that's not a very promising start, but um, <laughs> just bear with me. So by normal, I mean I am not a physical specimen. Um, I'm 5'9". I'm in the bottom 20% of elite swimmers, if you can believe that. Um, I don't have particularly large hands or feet. My lung capacity is mediocre, um, bordering on poor. And, um, and yet I somehow got two gold medals this past summer. And so I will try to explain how that happened. Um, so as we just saw, I ended my career with a best time in an Olympic final for an individual gold medal. And I still can't believe that I get to say that. Um, but it may not be so weird for all of you to hear because that's probably when I popped onto your radar, if I did at all. Um, 
so I want to show you sort of the behind the scenes and how I got to this moment so that you can see the process and um, you can see how I was able to achieve this moment and realize that my secret sauce is transferable and um, applicable and hopefully useful to all of you sort of getting the most out of yourselves, being the best you can possibly be. Um, because as I reflect back, there were really three crucial things that did it for me. One was precise goal setting. Two was having a growth mindset. And finally, having incredible teammates. So there are plenty of lessons that can be learned through sports. Um, but what was really distinctive for me in swimming was goal setting. Sports and swimming in particular are the perfect environments for learning how to set and reach goals. And I really do mean ideal. Um, in my major of management science and engineering, I had to take a class or two on organizational theory. And as we're learning about what makes for a good work environment, what makes for effective goal setting, what makes for ultimate job satisfaction, I was sitting there and I was like, oh my gosh, swimming is the perfect job, <laughs> as much as I hate it sometimes. Um, it's ideal. Um, because the goals can be specific, whether you're a 13 year old and you wanna make, uh, you wanna make a time standard or a certain meet, it's there for you. They can be challenging, whether uh, you know, you're an eight year old who just wants to beat the person next to her, or you're a veteran Olympian who wants to make a third Olympic Games, there you can set difficult goals that are just beyond your grasp. And it provides you with instant feedback. You know, in practice, at your meets, your progress is easily tracked um, and easily measured, and the scoreboard and times are always impartial. And finally, there's task complexity. I've seen grown men and women spend two hours watching their dives, working on just this one second of a movement. Um, but there's always something to change and improve. So it was in this perfect environment that I was able to start setting goals as a six-year-old. And every week, month, and year since then, um, I was able to work on getting the next piece in the puzzle to achieving my dreams. And that's how I was able to become the best swimmer that I could. Even as a 10-year-old, I would tell my parents and coaches what time I wanted to go. And my dad would help me break it down by splits. Um, we would write it on a note card. And I would know every day in practice what times I should be hitting. So while my teammates were maybe goofing off or skipping practice, I was just this little aggressive 9 or 10 or 11 year old that knew exactly what I wanted to do and was breaking down the times and the pieces so I could do it. It was effective also because it was urgent. You know, there was a sense of you need to do something every day in order to get where you want to go um, in weeks or months or years from now. If I wanted a shot at getting the time standard at the meet, I saw how what I was doing every day was relevant. And it wasn't that I was inherently better or stronger or faster than any of the other kids at that point in time that were swimming with me. I was just better at seeing what I wanted to achieve and plotting out the path to get there and staying on it. My goals were never winning. Um, I just wanted to achieve my best. Um, my goals of time standards and meet qualifications were exciting to me and meant nothing to anybody else because they pushed me just beyond what I was capable of at that moment. Uh, Bill Gates says, most people overestimate what they can do in one year and underestimate what they can do in 10 years. And I love that. So please take a look at what I was able to achieve in 10 years in what was always historically my best event, which was the 400 IM. So you see on the bottom we have years, um, on the left we have world ranking, and on the right we have my time. And if there's no bar, that means that I was not in the top 100 in the world that year. So my progression was not linear, but it was progress. And making the Olympic team was a big wish for me up until maybe about 2013, when I had a pretty significant drop and went from 22nd to 5th. 
So then it became a legitimate goal. Then it became something that motivated me to get out of bed every day and go to practice and work hard. So I'll ask you, are your goals just actually big wishes? If you can't plot out straightforward steps to get from where you are to where you want to be, adjust. In 2010, my goal was to qualify for World University Games in Shenzhen, China, which I can assure you most of you have never been to or never heard of that meet. And it's not very glamorous, um, but it was an incredibly important and effective stepping stone for me in my Olympic progression. And it was clear and it was reasonable and it got me out of bed in the morning. So sometimes modifying your goals downwards in the short term to be more realistic can end up getting you further in two years, five years, 10 years from now. Play the long game with your potential and your ability. They're bigger than you think if you just give yourself time to get there. So these goals weren't glamorous, but they didn't have to be. They were sometimes nonsensical swimming jargon like NRTs or WIZITs um, long before they were cool and exciting and sexy goals like medals at the Olympics. Um, in fact, I didn't make it my goal to win an individual gold medal until three days before the 200 backstroke in Rio. <laughs> um, my goal leading up to the games and in the year before was to first qualify for and then medal in all three of my individual events. And that goal was clear and challenging and complex enough to motivate me every day in practice. And then, first day in Rio, I won silver in the 400 IM in a best time. So, checked that event off the box. Um, two years later, or two days later, I won bronze in the 200 IM. Another best time, another medal. So it's going great. But I started, I finally got that itch sitting at the edge of the warm down pool with my coach uh, after the 200 IM final. And I said to him for the first time in my life, I want to win, I want to beat her. <laughs> um, and he said, okay, let's do it. Um, and on the final 50, I don't remember anything from that race except the final 50. I remember two things. I remember hearing the crowd getting louder and I remember the thought going through my head of this is so cool that I'm competing for a gold medal right now. No thoughts of winning even at that point. Um, I was just happy to be in that moment doing my best um, and showing the work that I had put in. So just start. Do some serious self-reflection. Figure out what motivates you and what you want and then plot out the course to get there. Soon enough, the thing that you'll be reaching for that's just beyond your grasp is something that you never thought um, you'd be close to achieving. Just ask those two little words, what's next? What's the next thing in front of you? So the path to goals is not always linear, direct, or even successfully navigated. Um, but while spending 17 years working towards my goals, I've seen one trait again and again play the pivotal difference between successfully navigating the disappointments or throwing up your hands in resignation. And that's having a growth mindset. And I know we're a room full of engineers, and so we've all heard this, and how important it is in math, um, and telling young kids, but I think it's so fundamental to my success. It can determine how you see yourself, how you see the world, and what you'll ultimately end up achieving. Some people are born more inclined than others to face disappointments and or criticisms and rebound from it, but I can tell you that it's uh, a learned trait and that you can improve at it. So I first learned about it, even though I didn't know it was called a growth mindset at the time, in a somewhat painful way, as many of us do. Um, you've heard that you learn more in failure than in victory, but deciding which is which is a really interesting problem. What I mean by that, uh, when I was 11 years old, I was at a meet called Far Westerns in Morgan Hill. And it was a very long meet. This was the end of four days. It was raining. Um, it had been raining for like a month straight at that point. And we're a three hour drive from home. It's a Sunday night and I have to swim the 400 IM, which is the worst race <laughs> in swimming. Um, and I really did not want to be there. And I tried every trick in the book to get out of swimming in finals that night. But my parents and my coach, made me stay, they were my ride, and I had no other option. Um, and I swam the race very begrudgingly, but I won by one one hundredth of a second. 
And so a victory, right, from the outside. But my parents knew me better than that. And they knew that that was not my best effort and that I did not swim the best race I could and that I did not approach it um, in the best and most aggressive and most prepared way that I could. And so it was a long, uh, painful ride home. <laughs> but I learned a lot that day, and I'm glad that they always held me to those standards that they knew that I was capable of achieving. And I learned that um, giving in and scraping by feel really crappy, and that it's better to commit and to do the work and to expect more of yourself. <laughs> Um, so because of them and other diligent coaches throughout my career, I learned to attack my weaknesses. I learned that long-term success requires struggle and a willingness to humble yourself and be frustrated. And that's so much more important than immediate success. A growth mindset also requires brutal honesty. We grow from the thoughts and suggestions of family, friends, coaches, and colleagues, but only if we listen. So believing that you have the capacity to grow and improve dampens the sting of disappointments when they will inevitably occur. And there's hope and possibility in that pain if only you go seek it. I entered Stanford thinking that I was going to major in management science and engineering. After my freshman year fall quarter, when I took Math 42, which is some calculus class, I was like, oh no. <laughs> Engineering at Stanford is not for me. I am not cut out for this. Um, it was my first college math class and it was very theory based and it was really unfamiliar and it didn't come naturally to me. And I wasn't used to being bad at math. So I decided to switch directions and I went pre-med for about three quarters. And after an even worse experience in organic chemistry, <laughs> I was like, you know what? I'm gonna go back to math. <laughs> and it was way better. I had learned so much. I had learned how to learn, um, which was a really important lesson for me in college. And I crushed linear algebra that quarter and decided that I was gonna do management science and engineering again. Um, so I learned a really great lesson and that was it's okay to be bad at something. It's okay to think that um, you know, you're gonna have to work a little harder at it. And I also learned that everybody else in the class had no idea what was going on either. <laughs> but I just assumed that people knew what they were doing. And um, that was another good lesson is a lot of people out there are faking it sometimes. <laughs> uh, so if you like something and you enjoy doing the hard work, keep at it and it will get better. I failed to make the Olympic team in 2008 and 2012. Um, and that's a very public failure, especially in 2012. I got fourth in two events uh, where the top two make the team. And I got those pity stares that they give you around the meet where uh, you know, you're know you almost made the team but didn't. Um, but that experience didn't light some sort of fire under me. I didn't vow right then and there that I was gonna come back in 2016 better than ever and win four medals. Um, I just looked at what was next. I was gonna be a captain that year. We had NCAAs. I wanted to score points for my team. And so just looking at it um, in chunks, kind of breaking it up, made it more reasonable, and uh, I found my motivation and what was gonna keep me going for those next months and years. And then slowly but surely, I made the transition from seeing myself as capable of making a final at NCAAs to making the Olympic team and then meddling at the Olympics. So you have to keep this growth mindset even if it's yielding little to no um, immediate results. 10 years ago, I was a mediocre backstroker. This is my progression in the 200 back, the event that I won gold at Rio in. And I only trained as a backstroker because it was in the IMs, the individual medleys. Um, and then through some interesting events, a change in the event landscape, and my backstroke suddenly having a breakthrough and becoming world class, things got a little more interesting. And so this amazing opportunity to make the Olympic team and then win a gold only opened up because I was working hard at this stroke um, because 
I was working at it for some other reason. Sort of the growth mindset again. And it's more than just a way to improve your weaknesses. It's a way of going through life and interacting with people around you. A growth mindset helps you become a better teammate and a better leader. My favorite people don't self-promote. They don't talk about their accomplishments. My favorite people, and I'm sure yours too, um, don't dwell on the achievement. The people that you really want to be around are passionate and interested and intellectually curious. When you have a growth mindset, the achievement becomes the process of achieving. It doesn't matter whether you're setting out to win an Olympic medal or increasing your market share. Um, achievement really is just how well you navigate the journey. Do you def refine your process? Have you defined yourself too narrowly and missed out on other opportunities? Do you take an honest look inward before blaming it on external factors? Everyone can do this and everyone should do this. This is the way to go beyond your limits, not with some freak talent or once in a lifetime idea, but by doing the hard, smart, honest work every day. So this is all well and good. With proper goals and a growth mindset, I think you can get to about 90% of your potential. But the hardest part, as with most things in life, is the last 10%. The last 10% of everything that needs to be said in a difficult conversation. The last 10% of a project that takes so much longer than you thought it would to go from adequate to exceptional. And the last 10% of my potential was only ever achieved with the help of the people around me. My teammates, my coaches, my parents, mentors, and friends. When you win a race by six one hundredths of a second, to put on our dorky math caps, like that's not a significant. <laughs> the p-value on that is not good. Like that's, that's chance. If you swam that race again, like I probably wouldn't win. But in that moment, we all felt like we just couldn't miss. Like it felt inevitable that these medals were going to happen and that these swims were going to happen and that the team was going to do this. And that's because of the team atmosphere that we had created. So the magic of a true team defies logic and it can't be manufactured, which I realize is frustrating for organizations and schools and companies. Um, you know, I'm telling you, get that. Get that level of enthusiasm and all your dreams will come true, but I'm offering you no recipe. Um, but that's because it's different for every team and with every group. But I can tell you a little bit about the ingredients and that's where chickens come in. Uh, so in a 1971 study by Dr. J.V. Craig of Kansas State University, with the fabulous title of Social Behavior of Chickens as Related to Selection Practices and Productivity, he and his colleagues found that counterintuitive things happen when farmers tried to breed for the most productive chickens. Trying to make a super flock from these uber productive, high egg laying hens actually just made a group of really stressed out, socially aggressive chickens. <laughs> Which, one, is hilarious, but two, it's incredibly eye-opening. I think we can learn a lot from them. Uh, groups need all sorts of personalities to fill all sorts of roles. You need fiery leaders, you need organized, organized type A's, you need the quiet hard workers, you need jokers, relators, includers, and so on. But most importantly, team members need to be more concerned with the good of the team than they are with their own individual success. Um, in the background there, Katie Ledecky is jumping up and down seconds before she goes off to her ready room to swim the 800 free and break the world record by another like two or three seconds, which she does every time, and it's just incredible. <laughs> um, but you don't care in that moment. You're not thinking about resting your legs. You're thinking about celebrating and expressing your joy for your teammates. Um, putting your top five highest achievers in the same team uh, can just end up being a disaster sometimes because the best, most successful teams that I've ever been on where it seems like the little bit of magic is happening, every person sees their role and is happy to complete it. Fulfilling your role on the team can also help alleviate any jealousy for the success of others because instead you'll see it as a benefit to the team success. Two of the three captains on the women's side of the Olympic team this year did not medal. Um, 
And so by most metrics, it looks like they didn't help the team or contribute. But we know what they did because they led and they helped guide us and they made the team better. It's just harder to quantify that. So I know I just told you the importance of the quantifiable goals and looking at the data to improve and adapt, but this last 10% defies logical description. We've tried. Um, there's a man who works at USA Swimming. His name is Russell. He was a former uh, University of Virginia swimmer and he worked in aerospace engineering before deciding that what he really wanted to do was figure out what makes fast swimmers fast. And he spent the last decade at USA Swimming breaking down our strokes, looking at thousands of hours of film, looking at every angle of the elbow of to what constitutes the best catch um, and what takes you from good to great in those little inches and millimeters. So what I'm trying to say is he's very technical and we share the engineering mind. And um, at that meet, I think while we were watching Katie break the world record, we looked at each other and we just thought, how? Like, what is happening right now? But it's that last 10% of going beyond your limits that's the hardest and messiest because it's the human part. So I will ask you, are you acting like a stressed out chicken? <laughs> are you obsessed with your own productivity? Or are you energized by the success of others instead of being threatened by it? Are you in the habit of expressing your confidence in the ability of those around you? Because that will make yourself and others better. The key to truly squeezing every last bit of your potential out and blasting past whatever you thought you were capable of is getting your mindset right and then empowering people around you to dive in and be all in for the team's success. It's making other people better and using others to make yourself better. See the potential in your team. Realize the integral role that each member can play if everybody reaches a bit beyond their current abilities and then cheer your butt off when they do. So I began this speech by claiming to be normal and I hope that I've demonstrated to you uh, that my normalcy stems from the fact that what I believe to be the biggest factors in my success are um, all things that I've learned and gotten better at and made conscious efforts to improve. Effective goal setting can be learned. You can work to achieve and foster a growth mindset and you can learn how to be a helpful teammate. I wasn't born with a once in a generation talent, um, size or even desire, but I just spent 17 years growing into the best swimmer and student that I could possibly be. You will go so far beyond whatever limits that you thought were possible by asking yourself and the people around you, what's next? Thank you very much. I think we'll do questions now if anybody wants to, and there's a mic being passed, so. I have a mic. Let me know. She has a mic. Let me know. Or Ooh, just works. speak really loud. Anyone? Questions? All right. I can yell. Okay. <laughs> Are you still swimming? I am not. I am retired. Um, yeah, and enjoying it. But <laughs> yeah. Do you think that your experiences in sports, in particular in swimming, with um, dealing with failure or victories, however they were defined in the moment, mm -hmm. um, prepared you better to face some of the challenges um, that you academically, like the experience that you described in your calculus class, and mm -hmm. you know the fact that you were able to go back to it, and you know you tried something harder and went back to it? Yeah, I really, I really think it was helpful. I think sports are great because. They help um, teach you how to take um, coaching and not criticism per se, but you know, constructive criticism, like things could, that you could do better without sort of tying that into your personality and um, a reflection on you as a human being. And so I think learning that and growing up being taught like, you know, fix your arm or do this better in practice and hearing that and thinking okay that's something I can improve um, helped me when I took this class and I was not doing well so instead of I mean I thought at the beginning like this reflects on me personally I'm bad at math um, and then I was able to realize like 
it's okay, that doesn't mean that I'm dumb or you know, it doesn't mean that I'm a failure, it's just this class that I didn't do very well at. And so I think um, being able to separate your worth personally from you know, something that is going wrong is, uh, was really effective and swimming definitely helped me with that. Yeah. Any other questions? Okay. So how would you say that the physical pain that swimming causes mm -hmm. compares to the mental strain that earning an engineer degree causes? <laughs> yeah, um, definitely different muscles. Uh, we would always talk about how, much, how many calories studying burns though and use that as an excuse for sneaking chocolate into the library. But. Um, yeah, they're both really fun challenges, I thought. Like, I loved um, sort of that high that you get at the end of a good workout, and I loved going into the library and cranking out problem sets. Like, that was just something that I really enjoyed, um, and sort of the struggle at that. And so it's fun to be able to use both your brain and your body, um, and that was definitely something I missed in my two years of being purely a professional swimmer, was using my brain and exercising that sort of as a muscle. But yeah, both. Both equally rewarding, I would say. Yeah. Um, I was just wondering, what made you want to become an engineer? Like, why not just retire and you know, live the rest of your life, you know, without doing anything? Because <laughs> that would be so boring. Um, I actually had a moment of panic where I was considering, like, what would happen if my life just was swimming for the next four years and um, this panic set in and was like, is the most I'm ever gonna use my brain behind me? Like was Stanford kind of the most that my brain will ever be challenged and I'll ever be um, stretched and I really didn't want that and that was a kind of an interesting revelation to me. So I think, you know, going through school, growing up, working hard and academics, um, that wasn't something that I was ready to surrender and um, I think that's a really important part of me and as much as swimming is a part of me, um, school is definitely really important to me as well. So I'm excited for the challenge of, you know, using that still. Yeah. So you got an engineering degree and you were training to be Olympian, but you also got married in that period. If, mm -hmm. And so how did you squeeze all that in? <laughs> um, so luckily marriage came after school was done. So that would have been a little crazy, but um, yeah, I, we got, I got married in the fall of 2015, and there were definitely a lot of spreadsheets involved in the wedding planning, and you know, that helps, but um, yeah, it was a great time. You just balance everything, it's all good, and I, some people I think need to like, totally go all in in one thing. For me, it was better for my swimming when I had other things outside of it to think about and distract, so you know, if work's your thing, I think having hobbies outside of it is good, and if the hobby is your thing, having work to do is also good. So yeah, it was a good balance. So I have a question. Where is this coming from? Oh, sorry, hi. <laughs> yes. What's next? And uh, more importantly, the process you went through to figure that out yeah, for swimming. That's a great question. So what's next is uh, starting at McKinsey in a month, um, which I'm so excited for. I chose consulting because I didn't know exactly what I wanted to do um, and I thought this would be a good way to kind of see a lot of industries and a lot of different areas within companies to see what would be the best fit for me eventually um, or maybe I'll end up there for a long time who knows um, but I haven't fully planned out my goals for this next area of life I think I need to get a bit more experience under my feet before I figure out what it actually is but I'm just excited by all these different um, problems and areas of interest that I have and really looking forward to the next phase. Yeah. Um, so what made you uh, think that pre-med was a good direction to go after? <laughs> <laughs> I have no idea. Um, I did well in like a beginning kind of like physical chemistry class that we had and I thought maybe that's the route for me. It was misguided. My parents were very helpful in like standing back and being like, yeah, sure, like go for that. And then I found my way back eventually. <laughs> it was interesting to see. Yeah. 
Okay, I have two questions for you. The first one is, what's your favorite stroke? Backstroke. <laughs> <laughs> and it was before that too, so. I'm not just saying. And the second question was, how were you able to manage your time um, mm -hmm. with the two, uh, with pursuing an engineering degree and swimming while you're in Stanford? Yeah, so, um, it, it took a quarter or two to kind of figure out what my, what it looks like to study and swim in college. Um, you know, there's just more time that you're spending in the weight room, at practice, working classes around, but we all agreed as athletes, like, we used our time so much better than normal students were. Um, like, people, it would, it would be interesting to go back, because at Stanford, athletes live with non-athletes their first year, and they would be up until like two or three in the morning. I never stayed up past like 12.30 my entire career at Stanford, um, because I just did the work that I had to do. I valued my sleep, and I, um, when I was able to have free time and do my work, I did it. And um, I think it's really helpful to have that kind of like set scheduling in your day. You can't dilly dally for five hours and then start your work at 10 p.m. because you will die like <laughs> trying to wake up in the morning the next day. So it was really helpful to have the structure and the time constraints in a weird way. My, you mentioned uh, the team effort. Can you tell us a little bit about coaching and uh, give us some insight to the coaches you had? Yeah. Yeah, so I was really lucky to have um, amazing coaches through my career. I grew up with a coach from age 8 to 18 in my club swimming. And then um, Greg Meehan, who coaches at Stanford now, um, was just totally instrumental in my swimming career and kind of the, the pivot it took. But I think the best coaches are, they check their ego at the door. It's not about them. It's about making their athletes better. And um, it's about, like I said, kind of figuring out how to communicate to each athlete um, sort of individually. You know, everybody learns differently. Everybody has different um, ways of hearing the message. And so um, communication was so crucial and just making sure that the team is on the same page, um, delegating roles and responsibilities, making sure that everybody feels involved somehow in the matter um, was really great for one, the individual's success, and then also for the team's success after. Um, and I was lucky to have coaches that kind of always saw like two steps beyond what I thought I was capable of and um, you know, some athletes come with these really outlandish dreams and the coach is like, okay, we'll try to get you there. And for me, I was like, I think I can do this. And they were like, well, I think you can do this and let's, um, let's kind of do that. So it really helped me grow and see what I was capable of. And I think good coaches and good leaders can be make or break in, um, in successes, which is kind of scary, but also kind of cool. Any other? Oh. Hi, Maya. Hi. Uh, apart for, apart from swimming, do you enjoy any other sports? Like doing them or watching them? <laughs> <laughs> doing them. Uh, I mean, it's hard for. Me. I'm just so bad at every other sport, but <laughs> I enjoy playing beach volleyball, uh, I'm terrible at it, but I think that would be fun. That's always the sport that I would say if I could do anything else, I would do that one. Yeah. yeah. All right. I'd like to welcome Jessica back to the stage. Thank you. I'm going to thank you again. Oh, let's So thank you again to Maya. If we can give her another round of applause. So I now have one last surprise for a special guest tonight. But before I invite them up, I ask Maya to join me on stage again. <laughs> Nothing scary. <laughs> so <laughs> thank you again, Maya. And I know this might be a surprise to you, but you know as we ate dinner tonight with a very special guest, 
Sui HQ received the following email from a mom of a Sui Next Design Lab attendee in our audience. So let me read that email. It said, hi Sui. <laughs> My daughter, an eighth grader, and I are signed up to do the design lab and the parent educator program in San Jose. That was our activity that happened this afternoon for middle school girls. My daughter is currently involved in robotics and is showing a lot of interest in STEM. She has been a competitive swimmer since she was six years old and is in the national track. She is truly in love with the sport. However, it has been hard for her at times to manage schoolwork and robotics and her sports, which requires her to practice six to eight times a week. We were actually talking about how she's doing morning practices already, so. <laughs> I think it would certainly be a positive experience for her to listen to Maya so she can give her overview of her swimming career and how she managed being an engineer. Is there a chance she can attend? Thank you, Betty. So, thank you to her mom, and what a story, and as you know, she's a 10, here she is. <laughs> and as we've heard throughout conference, we understand how important it is to have a mentor, specifically for women in engineering. And for this young middle school student, who also attended our design lab, not only is her mother, as a role model, so is our Olympian, Maya. Mm. So in her journey in Sui's mission to stimulate women to achieve their fullest potential in engineering, I invite Betty and her daughter, Jadelyn, to the stage to take the first photo. <laughs> okay, and actually we're gonna do it on the side here because we have these super cool star backgrounds. So we're gonna do it, that's much more exciting than just this black velvet. Well, I'd like to thank you all again. I will see you uh, in Austin at We 17 if not sooner, and have a great evening. Thank you, everyone.